I want to say thank you to everyone who took the time out of their schedule to be here with us today. Thank you. Um, for those who are standing in the back of the room, there are a few seats up here in front, um, so you don't have to stand the entire time while listening to the wonderful presentation we're going to get today. So thank you for joining us for our briefing, the Momentum Shift, How the Millennial Generation is Reshaping America. My name is Angela Manso, and I'm the Director of Policy and Legislative Affairs for Naleo Educational Fund. NALEO stands for the National Association of Latino Elected and Appointed Officials. Today's event is sponsored by the Population Association of America, which is a professional association comprised of over 3,000 po population scientists, including demographers, sociologists, and economists at academic institutions and non-academic organizations who are conducting research on the individual, societal, and environmental implications of human population change. PAA members conduct interdisciplinary policy relevant demographic or population research with direct and indirect support from federal research and for example, the National Institutes of Health, National Center for Health Statistics, National Science Foundation, and my personal favorite, the Census Bureau. Today's briefing focuses on a topic that I think is very relevant to congressional staff, current trends among millennials, and how this generation is poised to influence our nation's future. Our speakers will be addressing not only general demographic trends among millennials, but also delving deeper into the potential implications of their growing ethnic and racial diversity. I know they're also going to be reflecting on how current debate regarding the inclusion of a citizenship question on the 2020 census could potentially affect both the participation of millennials in the 2020 census, and as a result, our ability to understand this generation's influence on American society. So our distinguished speakers for today are Dr. Bill Frey with the Brookings Institution and author of Diversity Ex Explosion, and Dr. Julie Dowling from the University of Illinois Urbana-Champaign and author of Mexican Americans and the Question of Race. And their bios are in your folders that you'd have gotten um, when you came into the room. I would like to thank our congressional sponsor, Congresswoman Rosa DeLauro, and the staff for sponsoring and supporting our event today. And just a few housekeeping matters as, before we get started. The speakers here today are, um, are not here to express or advocate for specific policies. Any positions they may express are their own and do not necessarily reflect positions taken by the PAA or any of our co-sponsoring organizations. All of you have copies of the slides that you're going to see today in your folders, and I understand the PAA will also be posting these on their website. Um, we are going to hold questions until the end of their presentations today. Uh, the speakers are timed. <laughs> and uh, so it will be plenty of time to ask your questions um, at the end of our session. If you're going to be tweeting about this today, um, our hashtag is going to be Millennial Trends. Thanks for your attention. And with that, I will turn this over to Dr. Frey from Brookings. Thank you. Thank you very much, Angela. It's, it's a real pl pleasure for me to be here today. I think ice cream and millennials is a, is a great combination. So I think that uh, it's good to have a, a full room for, for this. Um, you know, I have a confession to make. I'm not a millennial, uh, even though I'm going to talk about millennials. I mean, there are different ways of classifying who millennials are. Researchers differ. I use people born between 1981 and 1997. And there are others that even have wider uh, bands, but none of them are so wide to include me. But I, I just have a question of how many millennials are here in the audience today? Okay, so that's quite a, <laughs> that's quite a group. Um, and I, so what I want to say is there's a lot in this here for you millennials, but there's also a lot here for people who just, who did not raise their hand, who I assume are older than millennials. And uh, because I think that uh, how um, we as a nation treat millennials, especially the really the, the most diverse young adult population that we've had in our, in our history up till now is going to mean a lot about how the country moves ahead and how us older generation folks are going to benefit as a result of the way this diverse generation is, be, is able to succeed in terms of how they you know, turn out in terms of their own success, their ability to uh, overcome barriers with respect to race and other kinds of issues. How we deal with that and how we let them do that is going to be very important. Uh, the reason I started working on millennials is uh, after the 2010 census, uh, and I've seen a lot of censuses, someone my age, uh, I was really very uh, wowed 
by the diversity that this country had. I mean, I was following the racial trends and the ethnic trends in the U.S., but I was really wowed. You can really only know how big a certain population group is from a decennial census. You have to count everybody, and by counting everybody, it's much better than a survey. It's much better than any, any kind of data. And so it's important to keep that in mind. I know Julie's going to talk a little bit about the 2020 census and, and some of the questions in that. So uh, that's really important. The census is, is really the benchmark. Anyway, as a result of this, uh, I published this book, uh, Diversity Explosion, which is a new and updated edition coming out next Wednesday. Just thought I'd mention it while I'm here. <laughs> and um, in, in talking about the book, what I learned, and, and in sort of just following things in, in society and in politics, we have kind of an older generation, a largely white generation, which has really made its success in the 20th century. And the younger generation of millennials and post-millennials, much more racially diverse, which I call the 21st century uh, generation. And I think the millennial generation, and this is how I decided to, to do a little more work with millennials, is really the bridge between this older 20th century generation and this younger 21st century generation. And it's really a bridge to a more racially diverse America. And so what I want to talk about today uh, is covering some aspects of the millennial population, but focusing on, a lot on this racial diversity and the bridge role of, of millennials. So here's a chart. Uh, well, well, here are the things I'm going to be talking about. Uh, who are millennials and how distinct are they? Where are millennials living? And uh, how will they serve as a bridge across generations? You know, I think we know, think we know a lot about millennials, but if you listen to a lot of the major media, you get the idea that most millennials are young professionals living in Brooklyn. That's not really the case. Uh, there's, there's a lot of people with different backgrounds, different ethnicities, different educational attainment and all this, and we're trying to cover that a little bit. But I first want to get to this bridge generation thing a little bit. And what I show here is four broad age groups uh, and the racial profiles for each of these four broad age groups. People age 55 and over, these are as of 2015. So people age 55 and over, a lot of baby boomers and some people older than baby boomers. Uh, you can see very white population. The 35 to 54 year old age group, largely Gen Xers, but a few ba baby boomers in there. Uh, and that of 62% white is about what the US population is. So Gen Xers uh, have kind of the racial profile of, of the US population. But when you get down to the uh, millennial population, 18, ages 18 to 34, you see that only, uh, you see that uh, 50, 56% of the millennial population is white uh, compared to 75% of the older generation. And when you get down to the post-millennial generation, uh, we're getting close to half and half. In fact, new census numbers that came out a few weeks ago show that the population under age 10 in the United States is minority white, according to census definitions. So this is important to understand the way our population is moving forward. Uh, now, a lot of people will look at this diversity. I mean, it's, it's important to understand how we've gotten so diverse. And, and, and sometimes there's an unfounded uh, fact that it's current immigration that is making this country so diverse, so racially diverse with all the Latinos and Asians and so forth. Well, it's true that immigration over the last three decades has helped to make our country more racially diverse. But in fact, right now, most of the growth in the Latino population, most of the growth in the minority population in the United States is due to natural increase. That means births to people already here. So we're going to continue to become more diverse irrespective of our immigration patterns going forward. And we need to understand that because that's really the nature of the youth and, and, and of course now the young adult millennial population. I'm gonna do something that's kind of demographically wonky here. This is something that's like a half of a population pyramid. And what I'm showing you is for 1980, um, the age uh, patterns of people going from zero, zero to four at the bottom to 85 and over at the top, and the length of the bars are the size of the different populations in those age groups. That group that's age 16 to 34 are the baby boomers back in 1980. There was no millennial born yet in 1980, but in 1980, the baby boomers were really the big part of the population. They impacted the economy, they impacted you know, society in all kinds of different ways. And uh, you can see that the influence even that the baby boomers have today is a result of the fact that back then they were one third of the US population. Well, let's move to 2015. And the baby boomers move up to the older ages. They're now in 2015 ages, uh, 51 to 69, but there are the millennials popping up, age 18 to 34. 
Uh, they have some competition still with the baby boomers, but they are kind of a force to be reckoned with themselves. I want to mention two things about the millennials on this population pyramid that are important. One is, like the baby boomers, they're a bigger population than people slightly older than them and people slightly younger than them. So they have that extra impact on what's going on. The second thing I want, to, want you to see is that among those people younger than the millennial population, there is a shrinking part of that population are whiter young people, and an increased part of that population are racial and ethnic minorities. And what this means is as going forward, as that young population moves into those labor force years and later, uh, it's going to be a much more racially diverse America. It's baked in the demographic cake when you look at it this way. And a lot of people don't understand that this is really what our future is when we look at these kinds of statistics. Now I want to say a little bit about some of the attributes of millennials. Uh, one of them is that they're global in many ways. For example, one quarter of millennials speak a language other than English at home. And in fact, one out of six millennials are multilingual. They speak a language other than English at home, and they're fluent in English. So we're a very multilingual uh, generation, much more so than earlier generations in the United States. 29%, almost three out of 10, are first or second generation Americans. Again, bigger than earlier generations when they got to be this young adult age. And then also 14% of married millennials are in interracial marriages. Uh, this is compared with one out of 20 baby boomers uh, when they were the same age. So in lots of ways, millennials are very different and very sort of connected to other backgrounds and other ethnicities and sort of globally connected. A couple of attributes of millennials I think you probably already know about. Uh, this sort of the proverbial millennial living in their parents' basement. As a result of that, we see that millennials are putting on hold or putting off getting married, putting off having children, putting off some of those attributes of their uh, uh, life that uh, earlier generations didn't. Here's kind of a complicated slide, but what it shows is for each broad racial group, uh, the three bars represent uh, for baby boomers, for Gen Xers, and for millennials, the percent who were married at age 25 to 34. So for whites, for example, the baby boomers, when they were 25 to 34, 70 percent were already married. Now only 48 percent of white millennials are currently married. Similar kind of trends you see for the other racial groups. Uh, so you know what this means is you certainly have more independence for a lar larger part of your youth if you're a millennial, but it also uh, sort of keeps you from getting that start maybe towards home ownership or start starting a career. A lot of this has had to do with the recession, the 2007 to 2009 recession, which increased unemployment rates dramatically and kept younger people from going into the labor market quickly, and also the housing market crash, uh, which has kept them from going into home buying, which is, we're still feeling the effects of. Here's another attribute with uh, millennials that I think uh, people understand, and this is they're the most educated young adult generation that we've ever had in the United States. 36% of millennials have college degrees who are age 25 to 34. There's only 24% among baby boomers when they were that age. Here again, we see that that increase in college education is occurring for whites, blacks, Hispanics, and Asians. So that's the good news. The not so good news is we still have a very sharp racial disparity in educational attainment between whites and some Asian Americans on the one hand and African Americans and Hispanics on the other hand. Uh, now there is improvement among Latinos and blacks every year. New statistics come out and say that there are more uh, blacks and Latinos getting post-secondary educations. Fewer of them are dropping out of high school. But you can see this disparity this is still there. There's a historic aspect to it. That is, many blacks and Hispanics live in underfunded, segregated, uh, grew up in underfunded, segregated school districts and segregated residential places. Patterns have brought that about, and that still exists. There's also the fact that the parents' generation of many of these folks aren't able to give them the kind of support for college tuition and other kinds of costs that you would need to go to college. Sometimes, in fact, it, it goes the other direction. The young people are expected to bring money back to the parents because of the way things are going uh, for them. So, I mean, this is an issue I think that really we need to be concerned about as we move forward uh, because, as I said, the millennial population is much more racially and ethnically diverse. Just a quick one on home ownership. We also see this di divisiveness uh, between whites uh, on the one hand and other racial minorities in the percent 
who uh, own their home. Now, it's true that millennials, as I said earlier, are less likely to own homes than other generations when they got to this age, to some degree due to the economy and the housing market and stuff like that. Uh, but that especially had uh, the impact of widening the racial disparity uh, because of that, because especially African Americans and Hispanics dealt with these kind of risky mortgages, some subprime sub mortgages and, and these sorts of things, higher uh, foreclosure rates during the post-recession economy kept that wider. So I mean, I think as a result of some of this, I can say uh, that there are two indicators that broadly people understand are important for future success. One is education, which has a relationship with your future income. The other is home ownership, which has a lot to do with your future wealth accumulation. And in this respect, there's a real divide within the millennial generation by race ethnicity. And going back to that demography that I showed you earlier, there are much bigger, these minority populations are much bigger part of that new college age population, home buying population as we move into the future. The new census statistics for the people under age 10 show that 40% of kids under age 10 are either Hispanic or African American. Slightly less than half are white. And you can see that pushing ahead when folks go into the years. And so how a millennials fare as role models, as people who can be uh, you know, symbols of success for this younger generation are gonna be very important as we move forward. Now I wanna say a little bit about where millennials live. Uh, millennials, the younger population grew by about 5% between 2010 and 2015. It's largely, as I said, millennials are a bigger generation than the one right before it, so you can see that young adult population growing a little bit. But for those black uh, metropolitan areas on this map, like Seattle and Denver, and the few in Texas, as Dallas, San, uh, Dallas, uh, San Antonio, Austin, uh, and a few other places, that growth is more than 5%. It was 10% or higher. Other places, uh, the whiter dots, mostly in the Midwest, that growth isn't very rapid at all. So there's a, there's a disparity across metropolitan areas in, in the growth of millennials due to migration patterns. Interestingly, when you look at by race, I didn't put that up here, the biggest gaining uh, millennial metropolitan area in the United States for blacks is Atlanta, followed by Dallas and Houston and later Washington, D.C. So there's uh, different groups are going to different places and it's still, for a long time, Atlanta's been a big magnet for African Americans and now African American millennials. There's, of course, disparity across states in terms of just the racial composition of millennials. Those red states in the Southwest, and then also Florida, Georgia, Maryland, and New Jersey are minority white millennial populations. Less than one third of California's millennials are white. There's another set of orange states there. There's 10 of those where more than 40% of their millennial population are minorities. And those nine states that are the very light yellow they're ones where still 80% of the millennial population is white, like Wyoming or Iowa or West Virginia, you can see. Here's another sh slide that shows metropolitan area disparities by race. You can see Los Angeles uh, has a very small percentage of whites, and over half of the millennials in the Los Angeles metropolitan area are Hispanic, whereas in Atlanta, blacks are the big uh, population group among Hispanics, and in Minneapolis, St. Paul, still largely white. Uh, I did some other data, I don't have slides for them, but there's also variation across metropolitan areas in educational attainment. Remember I said that 36% of millennials have college degrees. In Boston, 58% of millennials have college degrees. And in, uh, in uh, Central California, uh, it's more down into the 14 or 15% for, for, for the millennial population. So, uh, you know, there's a lot of disparity and I think these places that uh, are wanting to look at the next generation after millennials to be able to uh, see how they're gonna fare in the labor market, see how they're gonna be prosperous. They need to see that you know, there's a great deal of variation and they need to look at that homegrown millennial population to see how they're gonna be able to fare, maybe attract people from somewhere else, but they need to know how that differs over time. So now I wanna talk about this, more about this bridge to the next generation. Uh, and uh, or how the millennials are a bridge between uh, yesterday's America and tomorrow's uh, America. You know, we talk about generation gaps in the United States uh, from time to time. Uh, back when I was young, the generation gap was in the 60s. A lot of baby boomers were thought of as being the Woodstock generation, the Woodstock generation. I wasn't at Woodstock myself, but the Woodstock generation was made up of people who had sort of a counterculture back then. They were revolutionary and they sort of were quite different in their outlooks than their parents were. Well, millennials also are part of a generation gap. You might say in terms of social attitudes like favoring legalization of marijuana or favoring uh, same-sex same marriage, 
uh, or maybe there, there are difficult attitudes about institutions in the U.S., like organized religions and so forth, that that may be part of a generation gap. But I think the biggest generation gap for millennials is based on race and culture. And by that I mean, uh, if you look at the, I've redone this again, this is again the race profiles, but I brought this down to three age groups, people older than millennials, people age, over age 35 in 2015, millennials age 18 to 34, and people younger than millennials under age 18. You can see how the very different racial breakdown is also representative of different sets of attitudes, different sets of issues, different sets of concerns about the future. Uh, and if you think back about older baby boomers, people my age, older white baby boomers, uh, many of them, not necessarily me, but many older white baby boomers, are kind of scared about this changing demography in the United States. And if you think about it, uh, older white baby boomers grew up at a time uh, when there wasn't much immigration, where the black population was highly segregated, and they're scared. And uh, when you see that we're moving into a situation in the country where uh, you know, surveys show that older whites really don't want to see as much immigration in the future. They don't want to support government programs that affect children because they don't see them as their children or their grandchildren because they're different race and ethnic backgrounds. That's kind of a problem uh, that we need to deal with because, as you can see, we need to invest in that younger generation. So I think that, uh, you know, moving ahead, the, the millennial generation is really going to be the key towards making this go. And they have a lot going for them because they're well educated, they embrace diversity, what, they have, what they're going to need is more help from the rest of us and from the rest of the population to make sure there's investment not only in their careers but also the, the careers below them. And so I'm just going to end and say I'm a demographer and I think demography is destiny and when you look at the demography going ahead you're going to see that it's the racial and ethnic uh, makeup of millennials and especially post-millennials that are going to shape this country in the next century. It needs, the older population needs to recognize this so we can invest in that future. Thanks. See how much more information he had? Look at that. <laughs> All right. Well, my name is Dr. Julie Dowling, and I'm a professor at the University of Illinois Urbana-Champaign. I'm going to be talking to you all following um, Dr. Bill Frey's presentation about the changing demographics for millennials with information about Latino millennials, basically, and particularly about the changing race and ethnic questions, how they need to sort of shift at our national level to be able to better account for diversity in this country. So Latino millennials make up the second largest segment of the millennial population. That is, one in five millennials are of Latino background. Research shows that Latino millennials often feel racialized, though, as non-white and sometimes as non-American. For example, sociologist Nilda Flores Gonzalez's book, Citizens But Not Americans, which came out last year, she interviewed Latino millennials about their experiences. These were US-born Latino millennials growing up here in this country, and many of them talked about feeling as though they were seen as somehow less than American racialized because of their last name and physical appearance, felt as though they were not treated as being fully American. So she talks about them being citizens, yet not fully feeling American. Yet, while these Latinos are feeling racialized, according to our federal statistics, they don't really occupy a racialized location in terms of federally recognized racial categories. What do I mean by that? Well, let's take a look at the census, for example. So for the last four censuses, basically, we've had separate questions for Hispanic ethnicity and a racial question, with the racial question not having a Latino-Hispanic option, right? It has white, black, it has American Indian, Alaska Native, various Asian origin groups, and an other race category. Now, there's a whole history of how this came about. There's actually a great book by Christina Mora called Making Hispanics, which tells that whole history. Don't have time to tell it here, but it's been this way for the last um, four decades, basically. And so this leaves many Latinos in a conundrum. What do I put for my race, they think? You know, I don't occupy this white, black, or these Asian categories. Many will opt to then put in other race. But in 2010, they added some new language to the race and ethnicity questions. You'll note at the top there, it says, for this census, Hispanic origins are not racist. So this then leaves people feeling like, can I write in that I'm Mexican-American? Is that allowed? I had someone write me actually last week who's filling out a federal form, this is what I research, and says, I don't know what to put for this. I'm filling out this federal form, and they asked me for my race, and I'm Mexican-American, but it tells me I'm not supposed to write that down. 
I want to write this guy back. It's really complicated. <laughs> you can write whatever you want, dude. Just write it in. <laughs> but basically, that's what it tells you, okay? There's a few other things that are a little bit problematic about the question setup. Notice how we ask Latino groups where they're from. Are you Mexican-American? Are you Puerto Rican? Are you Cuban? We also ask Asians for their national origin. Do we ask white people or black people that? No. We just kind of assume they're just from here. Not all black people are from here. People can be from Nigeria, from a variety of other countries. African American is its own ethnicity, right? Your population is from Africa. You know, so why are we assuming that white and black people are not from anywhere else, right? But Asians and Latinos are from somewhere else. Again, there's an assumption of sort of foreignness that you're from somewhere else, basically, if you're of Asian or Latino background. So this is also an issue with us. Moreover, there's no Middle East or North African category on here, which also leaves people of back background struggling to answer it in the same way that many Latinos are. So back to this issue of Latinos and this race question. So many Latinos, when faced with this question, are like, I don't know what to check. I'm just going to leave it blank. And this leaves us with a lot of unanswered race questions for Latinos, which then requires follow-up, which costs money, right, for the Bureau to send somebody to talk to you to figure out what your racial background is. In fact, in 2010, 13% of Latinos didn't answer the race question at all. That's almost one in six, basically. 37%, despite the instructions, wrote in Mexican-American, Puerto Rican, Cuban, whatever their Latino origin was, under other race. So 50% of Latinos are saying, I don't fit in these OMB designated racial boxes that you have here. They either didn't answer it or wrote in other race, okay? Um, so basically, in addition to this issue with people not filling out or filling out other, when people do give you a race on the census, when there is a separate question, when there's no Latino option there, many studies have found that the race they give you doesn't actually match how they identify themselves. My book, Bill Frey plugged his, my book, Mexican Americans and the Question of Race, please go out and buy it, um, <laughs> detailed this, particularly looking in Texas. Basically, two thirds of Latinos in Texas say they are white on the census, okay? They'll kill you in, they don't really actually identify as white, and many of them don't look white and not seen by others as white. It's about not having an option there. It's also about a kind of defensive whiteness. And so along the U.S.-Mexico border in Texas, I found 85 to 90 percent of Latinos check white. Why? Because they're being stopped and asked for their papers, because they're being racialized and discriminated against, and because of that, they think by asserting white on this government form, I'm telling you that I'm an American, I'd like for you to respect that, right? So this issue of defensive whiteness that we see. Moreover, some studies such as Wendy Roth, which I cite here, looked at Dominicans and Puerto Ricans in New York, also found that when Latinos give you a race when there's no Latino option there, what they put usually didn't match what they looked like or how other people saw them. They're really just trying to fit themselves into categories that don't exactly fit them. So what else do we have here with the separate questions format? Unlike race, which since 2000 has allowed you to mark more than one race, um, according to the census for Latino origin, you can only mark one, okay? So you can be black and white, but you can't be Mexican and Puerto Rican. Those who mark more than one Latino ethnicity are reassigned one ethnicity, basically. So let's say you say you're Mexican and Puerto Rican, but you live in a mostly Mexican neighborhood. They might just assign you Mexican because that's the general population composition of your neighborhood. Also, like Latinos, as I mentioned, many people of Middle Eastern, North African background also feel as though they don't fit into the standard categories, and many would like to see a box there on the census. Okay, so in 2010, the Census Bureau decided maybe we can do something to fix this issue. And they did this alternative questionnaire experiment. Almost half a million households in the US, instead of receiving their regular census questionnaire, received an alternative version. And that alternative version had a number of things they tested, but most importantly for this conversation, several of those options included a combined race and ethnicity question. Essentially, it had Latino Hispanic in there with all these racial groups too, and said, please check all that apply. And this way, you can say you're Latino, you can say you're Latino and black if you're Afro Latino, you can say you're Latino and white. You know, you can mark whatever applies for you. Moreover, they tried to get some more symmetry here where other groups were also asked, like blacks and whites, were also asked for their ethnic options. In doing this, they also did a telephone call where you check something for your race and then someone calls you. One in five of those 385,000 who filled out these alternative questionnaires was called back and asked, you check this for your race. Is that how you label yourself? And in doing this and then extending that research with the uh, national content test in 2015 where they looked to refine this, 
Both of those studies had a callback. What they found was when they combined race and ethnicity, they got much better matched to how people actually labeled themselves, particularly for Latinos. If you said you were white and Latino in a combined question, you actually were. So let me give you um, some images of what this actually looked like. I know it's really small, but you also have these in your packet, so hopefully you can look at them in there as well. And so this middle one that's right here was one that was very favored in the focus groups for the AQE in 2010. Each group you see has its main header, white, Hispanic, black, Asian, and then a write-in box underneath with some examples listed next to it. This one looked like the one in the AQE, except it didn't have Middle East or North African yet. This was, this was from 2015. Okay, this worked out really well. The focus group really liked it. See the symmetry, right? We've got a balanced form. Everyone's asked for their major header and for their ethnicity under each. The only issue that happened with this is we lost some of the detail that was there. So remember in that older form, you've got different Asian national origin groups, different Latino national origin groups. So you had a box to check for whether you're Mexican American or Chinese, et cetera. When you ask people to write something in, some people aren't gonna write it in. I mean, when I get my census form, I'm really excited because I geek out over this stuff because it's what I do for a living, right? Most Americans, not so excited when they receive their census form. They just want to check a box and move on with their lives. And when the box wasn't there, they didn't fill in the rest of the detail. So they just checked Hispanic and Asian, and we lost some of the detailed enumeration we wanted for are you Mexican, are you Chinese, et cetera. And so then came this format here. Instead, we put underneath each one check boxes. So we have six check boxes underneath each category for the six largest numeric groups under that. For whites, that's German, Irish, English, Italian, Polish, and French. For Latinos, it's Mexican-American, Puerto Rican, Cuban, Salvadoran, Dominican, etc. And so most of these, then this accounted for like 80 something to 90% of the populations had a checkbox basically underneath there. And in case your group was not listed, you could still write that in. In terms of what this meant for looking at Latino racial identity, some people were concerned that we might lose racial differentiation. What about Afro-Latinos? People can be black or other backgrounds and be Latino. What they found, though, was that it primarily diminished the number of people who were checking white. But those individuals didn't really label as white in the first place. And so in the separate questions format, 52% of Latinos check white. When we move to a combined format with a Latino in there with everything else, it moves to 9 to 16%. But more importantly, when they called these people on the phone, they said, I am a white Cuban. Or maybe they were someone like me with an Irish American parent and a Mexican American parent. But it meant that they were white Latinos or had some sort of white background, as opposed to when they called those folks back and they said, there was nothing else there for me to check on the form, right? And so this gave us actual better data. 37% said other race in 2010, less than 1% when we did it with the combined question. So those folks went away. This went from being the second largest, or the third largest, I'm sorry, racial group in the country to less than 1%. And those who said black, American Indian, Asian who were Latino, those numbers stayed about the same. So we still had those folks. But more than 70% just wanted to say that they were Latino, Hispanic, and they could do that in this format. And more importantly, it matched. How people labeled on the form matched how they actually identified themselves. So then this was the format, the combined question with check boxes that went forward last year in the spring to OMB. Uh, and this was basically put forward for consideration by OMB for them to possibly approve. They needed OMB's permission to combine race and Hispanic origin because the previous directive had said those data should be collected separately. They also needed OMB's permission to be able to add a new category of Middle Eastern and North African. They waited and waited and OMB never responded. And so it got to be about nine months later or so in January of 2018 with no response, sort of a non-response ended up becoming a no. And then that basically meant that, that for the end-to-end -end task for the Census Bureau this year, this has been going on, sort of the dress rehearsal for the census, they had to stick with a separate questions and no Middle East or North African category. Despite the fact that this question was supported by 12 years or more of research, was supported by nearly every major group from Nalejo to Maldiv to Asian Americans Advancing Justice and all of these groups, people were all backed and behind this question. Because of OMB lack of approval, they were not able to go forward with it so far. I mean, there's still hope, but it's getting to be diminishing at this point. Okay, so what are we ending up with 2020? Right now, what's being tested in the field for the dress rehearsal for the census is the separate question format with the same for the census, Hispanic origins or not races instructions. The race question, we could ask about ethnic origins for whites and blacks. That's going to be new because they didn't need OMB's permission to be able to do that. It was an adjustment to what was in the directive. 
but there's still no Latino option and no Middle Eastern option, as I mentioned. And then there's the citizenship question. So if it wasn't sort of disheartening enough that over a decade's worth of research on something kind of went by the wayside, the citizenship question, which has been used in the American Community Survey, which is a small sample of people, but has not been tested in any kind of capacity for the census and has not been used in a decennial census, 100% count since 1950, is being proposed to be put on the census, right? And this is really, really gonna be a problem, right? We live in a climate, a political climate right now, which is having a lot of issues around the politics of immigration and immigrants. And there's a lot of fear that this is gonna really mess up our counts of people, fears for people filling this question out. It has not been tested at all in terms of how it will affect response rate. And this is a real concern. As an Aleo member, our uh, executive director, Arturo Vargas, recently said in a speech, it's like they're building a plane in flight. You know, we don't have this tested. And so over a decade's worth of research for a race question, not one single study about this in a census, and yet the proposal is to put it on the form. So what are the implications of this? Well, in 2020, many Latinos, if it stays the way it's going right now, are going to struggle to answer their race question. This means the possibility of having a lot of non-response follow-up to see what those questions, you know, to have to have somebody come to you and ask you what you want to put for your race. The tabulation of Latinos will not include multiple Latino groups now, when it was going to before in the proposed format. This is going to miss important detail on Latinos, particularly younger Latinos, who are more likely to be of mixed background. This citizenship question is threatening to increase our undercount, with some Latino in, in the Latino community calling for a boycott of the census or for a boycott of the citizenship question. Um, and then for Latino millennials who already may feel as though they're not fully accepted as American, this is creating a climate, basically, of hostility with very critical consequences. Finally, change is needed here. The current federal measurement of race must adapt to include options for Latinos and for Middle Eastern North African people, OMB needs to adopt a race and ethnic data collection standard that more fully reflects our changing, changing demographics, including millennials. We live in an increasingly diverse country, as Dr. Frey has mentioned, and our country is changing. And how we need to measure race and ethnicity also needs to change to be able to reflect that diversity. I will end there. Thank you very much. Thank you for those great presentations. So I will uh, take moderator's prerogative and uh, launch the first question, but I expect that after they've answered it, there'll be a lot of hands up in the room because you all are riveted by this data and really want to understand it that much better. So, <laughs> so uh, I'll go ahead and launch first. It's like, in light of what we know about the millennial generation, what do you think are the most relevant policy implications we should Well, I think anything that has to do with our youth, anything that has to do uh, with health care for families. Can you all hear him? No. Sure, sure. Okay, sorry. So the question that I asked was that in light of what we know about the millennial generation, what do we think are the most relevant policy implications we should consider? Yeah, I would say anything that has to do with our younger population and making sure that we do investments in their schooling and in their health care and in their parents' uh, ability to be able to support them. For example, there are many young uh, minority and white families where uh, are single parent families. A woman has to work, she has to also raise her kids, she has to make sure that there's kinds of rules in place where she can have child care or where she can take off in six days without losing her job. There are also kinds of traditions, there are also kinds of programs that need to be available for these young people uh, after school and so forth. Mm -hmm. uh, I think that, um, you know, as we move forward over time, of course the federal government has some but not a lot of influence on local uh, college and especially uh, uh, K to 12 education. But I think that increasingly at the state level and especially in states with large uh, minority populations, the biggest growth in child popul in the child population of all the states between 2000 and 2010 was in the state of Texas, and 95% of that growth in the state of Texas was due to minority. Now, I would say a state like Texas should be one that take a special interest in making sure that next generation of young people are, 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 are cared for, have the right kind of public schooling, and the right opportunity to go to post-secondary education. I'm not an expert on any of these policy issues uh -huh. is education or, or uh, you know, parents' uh, support and so forth. 
but I know that those are issues that uh, uh, fairly recently have not been on the front burner of the political discussions that I've been listening to. I listened to all of the presidential debates uh, before the 2016 election. I saw very little discussion of any of these issues there. Mm -hmm. To me, those all should be on the front burner rather than some of the things that we're discussing now. I would say pretty much everything that, that he just said in terms of education. I would also maybe add the immigration issues, basically, and making our society more welcoming on that front, doing something for our dreamers, basically, some of whom are in this millennial um, uh, uh, pocket, basically. Um, dealing with how we do with our criminal justice system. We have some incredible disparities there for Latinos and African Americans who are more likely to end up in jail. Part of that has to do with poverty. Part of it has to do also with policing, right? And so in terms of policy, making it to where, you know, uh, for example, Professor Victor Rios at um, University of California, Santa Barbara, talked about changing the way we talk about youth, really youth of color as being at promise, basically, instead of at risk. And so changing the whole way in which we frame young people of color as you know, not a threat to our society, but as people we want to encourage to become a part of the fabric of our society. And that's more than it's policy, it's also just a way of thinking, right, that needs to shift in this country. Great, great, thank you for that. So I'm looking out at the audience, I'm hoping to see some hands, great. This young man right up front, please, if you could just state your name and your question. scholars at Brookings and they all write lots of very important papers. That's one I haven't read, but <laughs> <laughs> uh, it sounds like a good idea and it sounds like something that needs to be studied. I mean, anything that takes a fresh look at the way young minorities are able to uh, make their way through the kind of public school system and also outreach into mm -hmm. post-secondary education uh, that goes beyond ways that have been keeping them out uh, is important. Uh, I would say it's important for the fairness to them, but it's even more important given these demographic uh, projections that I've put up here, because if we really are going to make sure people are well prepared for the kinds of jobs that we need in the next 10 or 20 years, these are the raw materials of our labor force going forward. Just for the perspective of just, you know, our own self-interest as a nation, in, a, in addition to what, what's the right thing to do to make people have the right kinds of opportunities. I think the thrust of that paper is right. I'm going to have to go back and read. So. Yeah, like uh, Dr. Bill Frey, I haven't read that paper either, but I, you know, I definitely agree with the sentiments of it. I think that you know we need to look more completely, basically, at at, at anyone basically applying to you know uh, higher education and look beyond people's test scores, right? I don't, being somebody who's a college professor, you know, myself, I mean, I see students coming in who sometimes feel as though like they didn't have the, at least in the me, they didn't have the lowest, they didn't have the highest test scores that they wanted, basically. And they can do just as well at the university. I think the university, and some universities do a better job than others at doing this, we need to look at, at, at students in a more complete picture, right? Where we're not just looking at basically test scores, but also at what kind of courses, how do they perform in their courses? What kind of activities have they had? What other kinds of leadership and ways in which they shine because you know standardized tests can't really necessarily be a strong predictor necessarily of everyone's success right we're going to miss a lot of people with that particularly people who are racialized or are coming to schools where they haven't had the prep classes right because people can increase their scores tremendously hundreds of points right you know from taking an, an SAT or ACT prep class and if you don't have access to that you're at a complete disadvantage it doesn't mean you can't learn or can't do as well it means you haven't really been given the same opportunities thank you for that young woman right front here
white is standard, that mm -hmm. um, the equation of white to Americans, we never see like Asian, Latinx people being um, called you know, all American. Um, I was wondering if you can kind of explain some of the harmful consequences mm -hmm. that has created for millennial generations and upcoming future generations. Absolutely. Um, you know, I think that this is a real issue, and it's something that particular that, that Asians and Latinos face, and also maybe people who are Middle Eastern or those backgrounds as well, but people who are perceived as being foreign, despite the fact that their family may have been here for generations or may have been here longer than many white residents. There's a, a famous uh, scholar, um, Ronald Takaki, a multicultural historian, who opens one of his books by talking about a cab ride he was taking to a multicultural conference, and the, you know, and the cab driver said, oh, your English is so good. He's like, well, my family's been here since 1850 or something like that. <laughs> I would think it would be, right? But the assumption that people have that someone who is Asian, Latino, you know, these, that these backgrounds, that they are from somewhere else, right? And that's one of the reasons why I feel like the question format needs to change on the census, because we do single out those groups as being from somewhere else, whereas we assume other groups are just from here and has a real effect, as I mentioned, Yula Flores Gonzalez's work, my own work, on how people feel accepted in our society, right? And how others treat them. And the perception, you see the anti-immigrant sentiment, people having um, you know, racial epithets yelled at them, or these encounters where people are told to go back to your country, right? Just based on what they look like. We need to change what we think of as being American and understand that people of these backgrounds have been a part of our society since our society began. Right? And that there's, you can't make an assumption based on what someone looks like about their immigration history in that way. And that even if the person is from another country or their parents are, that they still have just the right, as much a right to be here as you do, right? And I think we need to change our fundamental thinking about that. Thank you. Young lady over here in the corner. Sure. Um, yeah, there's no question about it that uh, millennials who have, uh, you know, thought about entering the labor market in the 2007 to 2009, post that period, that was the period of the Great Recession and around 2007, was also the period of the big housing bust, uh, you know, housing market crash, you could say. It was much more difficult to get mortgages. Uh, even today, uh, mortgage uh, costs are much higher for young people. It's had a long tail to it. The, the first millennial turned age 27 in 2007. So if you think about that group of people who came along since then over the last 10 years, uh, you know, now they're 37 and they're, the rest of the millennials have fallen apart, have had to deal with all of those things. And as I mentioned in, in my remarks, even more millennials than earlier generations that reached those ages were members of the Latino community, were members of the African American community who took especially hard hits and whose families took especially hard hits during that period. Uh, so, I mean, it's, again, I mean, there's a stereotype that there's this professional in Brooklyn sitting there and living, you know, kind of waiting, but it's, it's a very broad mix of people who are having to deal with this. this. Um, you know, my own feeling is that, you know, for some of these people it's going to be difficult, uh, but the economy is getting better. And uh, sort of the, the unemployment rate is down. Uh, Yes, they're saddled with college debts, and there may be something we can do uh, to help alleviate that if it's a, if it's a huge generational impact. It's, it's not easy to measure at this stage what, what that's going to be in the future. I do think, though, that the post-millennial population is entering the labor market at a better time, and that you know this may be an issue for some of the millennial generation, but as we move further and we're more enlightened, again, about dealing with investing in our diverse young people, we can get over that, but it, it's something, it's both an economic, but it also has a cultural aspect to it when you look at the younger generation. Okay. Thank you. Let's go questions. This young lady here and then this young man over here.
afraid right now is the citizenship question. The race question, like when that happened, or that looked like it's not going to be happening, that was pretty devastating. The citizenship question, and we're talking about people not even wanting to fill out the form at all, right, because of that. And that's going to have a huge impact in terms of, you know, um, state and local funding that comes from the government when you have segments of your population, whether it's red states like Texas or blue states like California, states that have larger numbers of people that have more high immigrant communities, such as Latino and Asian. Also something we were recently talking about, as an, I'm on the National Advisory um, Committee for the Census, and at our recent meeting we were talking about from hearing from some of our membership who are of um, American Indian background, that many American Indians consider themselves to be citizens of their tribes and may or may not wish to fill out U.S. citizenship on there. And so if the intent here is to, it, which I understand it may be, is to count the number of citizens in the state and then use that for the politics of representation for that state, that's going to be a real issue, right? You may have undercounts of Latinos, undercounts of Asians, undercounts of American Indians, undercounts of Middle Eastern individuals, undercounts of people who just don't agree with the question itself, because I know many people who are not members of those communities are like, I want to fill this out because I don't support this. I don't support what's going to possibly be done with this data. And so that's going to be a real economic issue that's going to face states when they lose funding because of that, political districting, basically, and what's going to happen with this. I mean, it's really quite, that's actually really quite terrifying. I think it's a way in which the census is being politicized you know, and used for um, purposes that it's not, it's intended to be a full count of everyone living here, right? And to the extent that this, we need to be sure that everyone is able to fill this out and be counted. And so this kind of issue, whether it's adding citizenship or not allowing people to find themselves on a form in terms of their race, will lead to make this much harder for individuals to be able to do that. Yeah, I agree with all of that. I mean, I think, you know, I'm old enough to have filled out lots of censuses, and the census used to be kind of a civic celebration. You'd get the census form, and you'd say, you know, I'm an American, I'm gonna fill out this census, I'm gonna feel good about it, it helps me become representative of my community, and of uh, my state, and so forth. And now, um, as Julie says, it, it has, a, has at least the threat of becoming politicized, where people will get this census form and they'll say, well, I don't really know if I'm gonna fill this out because somebody may come after me or something, uh, especially, especially they're here legally, but not as citizens. Uh, they may decide that people are, are going to be a bit of a threat. Uh, I'm not sure. You know, there are enough laws in place to keep the Census Bureau from sharing their data with other federal agencies, uh, but that's a hard sell in, in this current environment to people who want to fill out that census. And the, the long-term implications are not only for representation in Congress. They have to do with also if lots of states use the census results to carve out their state election districts. Uh, it has, will have an impact of over-representing rural areas, under-representing urban areas. And since they only take the census once every 10 years, hundreds of other kinds of surveys done by the private sector, done by the U.S. government, use that Census Bureau as their frame. And to the extent areas and population groups are underrepresented in those, we're just going to get a very faulty picture of what the U.S. is like for another 10 years. So from a scientific perspective, it's just really a bad time to do this. And I think a lot of people feel that it's brought with underlying politics uh, designed to underestimate the Latino population in the United States. Thank you. So this gentleman here, just raise his hand, and then the gentleman all the way in the back. Thank you. Uh, hi, my name is Peter. I work with Senator Grassley's office. And uh, I was wondering how you Well, I try to make the demographic argument that I made here, that if you're someone who's age 60 or 65 and you're hoping that your Medicare is going to be in place for the next 20 or 30 years and that there'll be enough money in the Social Security Trust Fund that is being paid into by workers over the next 20 or 30 years, those people are going to be young minorities, Latinos, Asians, African Americans, uh, and to the extent they're not going to be able to have the kinds of jobs and productivity which will give them the kinds of incomes to be able to contribute to those programs, you're going to be the loser. 
Uh, so it's not so much a let's be nice to these new Americans, although I would hope that would be enough of an argument for them. But you need to tell them, you're the one who's going to be suffering if we don't do more to make this next generation more productive and more a bigger part of our economy and our society. I would add, I, I do similarly, I also stress the billions of dollars that you know immigrants, even undocumented immigrants, contribute to our society. They contribute way more financially <laughs> to our society than they ever get back. If all the people here without papers were to suddenly disappear, all of society would fall apart. There'd be no one doing all of these jobs, basically. So I talk about the benefits. And if you have that, basically, you have these individuals who are providing the service for your country, why don't you want them to have the access to citizenship that would make them be able to be better participants and civically engage in our society? Right? So I talk about those, talk about economic interests, about economic interests can help those individuals come around, right? When I talk about it, I'm from Texas, so I'm used to talking to people who have more conservative attitudes about these issues than I do. And so I, I, I talk about those kind of economic interests. I talk about the changing demographics that we have. And I talk about the fact that you know our country has always had these shifts in terms of, of backgrounds. And even when these white migrants came here many years ago in the early 20th century, it wasn't exactly clear where all of these groups were going to fit. They weren't all racialized in the same way at that time period. That kind of came later, right? And so these, these narratives of the xenophobia, the fears of immigrants have been with us for a long time. And yet we've still stayed very strong as a country, right? And individuals who migrate here do adapt and do assimilate into our society if we would just let them fully assimilate and become a part of the fabric of our society. Thank you. So the gentleman in the back. Yes, my name is Adam and I'm with Peter Pelosi's office. And I was just wondering if either you all have done research on the group about that that or know of research uh, on the group about that, about which is uh, how many, is there a percentage now of millennials that self-identify as people with disabilities? Yeah. yeah, I don't have the number on top of my head, but I can tell you that we have many scholars in the Population Association of America that can talk to you at length about that, and I think the organizers here can um, help you with that. I'm afraid I don't have that answer on the top of my head. So who did you say so they were just indicating the Population Association of America, our sponsors. Mm -hmm. um, Mary Jo Hooksema, she's right here, she's part of the government relations team, would be able to put you in touch with some of the researchers that are looking at that question. If you also give me your card, I get I, at census all the time, and I can actually find out from someone there. Um, we have a few members of our National Advisory Committee who've done work on, on persons with disabilities, can probably find you maybe some reports or something. So just come see me after and give me your card. Thank you. Okay, that'd be great. Great. So we have more questions. I know there were hands up earlier. Anyone? Anyone? All right. Well, I want to thank you all for sticking around. This is great to have a full room at the end of this as well. <laughs> a big applause for our presenters today. Thank you.